17%, which the government says is unaffordable. The union's UK Deputy Director of Nursing, Lisa Elliott, has told tonight with Andrew Marr that something needs to be done about vacancies. The government does need to consider how they're actually going to, to address the workforce crisis that we have. Um, billions of pounds is currently being spent on temporary measures like agency staffing, but that doesn't actually resolve the workforce crisis that nurses are facing every single day when they go into work. In Scotland, ambulance staff and some NHS workers have called off strikes after two unions accepted a pay offer. Members of Unite and unions voted in favour of the deal, which will see an average rise of 7.5%. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting told Andrew Marr earlier that it shows what can be achieved when the government's willing to negotiate. When you've got RCN and Unison saying, we will suspend strike action this week if you talk to us about pay... I don't understand why the government wouldn't bite their arm off, to be honest, because we're calling in the army now. What, what an embarrassing state of affairs for this government, having to call in the army to clean up their mess. Meantime, RMT unions voted to reject the latest offer from Network Rail, meaning their strikes this month and next will go ahead. An urgent safety check is being carried out on Jersey's gas network following an explosion which killed at least five people. Fire crews had investigated reports of a smell of gas nearby the day before. And forecasters are warning temperatures could fall even lower. It reached minus 16 in Aberdeenshire last night, where the warnings are also in place for snow and ice again tomorrow. LBC markets report the FTSE 100 has closed down 30 points at 74.45. The pound buys $1.22 and €1.16. Euro LBC weather staying dry for Wales and most of England with a low of minus 7. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. This is Cross Question. Just got eight o'clock, Ben Kentish here with you on LBC. Joining me in the studio for Cross, Cross, Cross Question tonight are Craig Whitaker, Conservative MP for Calder Valley and a former Deputy Chief Whip in the government of Liz Truss. Uh, Luciana Berger is with me, Chair of the Maternal Mental Health Alliance and a former Labour Change UK and Liberal Democrat MP. James Heal is here, Diary Editor of The Spectator, also co-author of the book Out of the Blue, the inside story of the unexpected rise and rapid fall of Liz Truss. And Zach Polanski joins me too, the Deputy Leader of the Green Party of England and Wales and a member of the London Assembly. Get your questions coming in. Lots coming in already. There are some slots left though. 0345 6060 973, the number to call. You can text your question to 84850 or tweet us at LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question. Watch on Global Player. This is LBC. Lots of questions uh, coming in already. Let's start tonight with Denise in Tooting. Denise, hi. 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 Hello, guys. Hi, Ben. How are you? Hi. What's your question to the panel, Denise? Um, basically, it's um, what would they do in order to reverse the um, effects of the austerity that the nurses have been dealing with for the last 12 years? What would they, what would they do to reverse that? Any particular area, Denise, you, you're thinking about there or just generally? Um, basically, the, they, they've had to deal with the austerity and the pay cuts and the, um, uh, um, the hours work and everything that they've had to deal mm. with over the last 12 years of conservative rule. But what they're going for their their their, their um their their pay rise now for other reasons other than just being a pay rise. But it seems to okay. that the government or the Conservative government are not seeing the reasons behind it. Got you, Denise, thank you. I think we've got your question there. Pay rises, Craig. NHS workers, public sector workers suffered years and years of real terms pay cuts. Your government's not reversing those. Why not? Uh, well, it's not just NHS workers. It's the whole of the UK economy. Anybody in the workforce has seen a real term cut for many years going forward. Uh, the problem now, of course, is that we see inflation at such a high rate. And it's like everything in life. You can have whatever you want, but it's got to be paid for. And the reality is the the uh, and I understand what Denise says that um, you know this isn't just about that the the trying to make a point, um, but the reality is um, you know you've got to pay for it and um, we just don't have the money to do so. 
10 billion pounds to give NHS nurses, NHS workers the pay rise they want. You found 400 billion during the pandemic. You spent 37 billion on NHS test and trace. It's a question of priorities, isn't it? Um, no, it's a question of how much do you borrow? Because all that half a trillion pounds has been borrowed and mm. it has to be paid back. And it's the same thing with this. You know, 10 billion pounds for nurses. It's, uh, you know, billions for other sectors. It's not just nurses. It's it's teachers. It's, you know, it's MPs. It's, you know, the whole of the civil service. Um, how do you fund that? If you want to fund it by borrowing more, then go ahead and do it. But somebody at some point has got to pay it back. Zach? Craig was in Liz Truss's government and he's learned the wrong lessons here. Borrowing is not a bad thing if you are using it to uh, fund investment, particularly green investment. Borrowing is a bad thing if you're using it to fund unfunded tax cuts. What we really need here is a wealth tax, a 1% tax on the richest 1%. That's for start. There's lots of other things I'd like to do. But the University of Greenwich have shown that if you do a 1% tax on the 1%, the Green Party wealth tax, that would raise £75 billion pounds a year. Oh, that's, that's if they stay. Well, also, that's if the wealthy stay. Well, I'm glad you asked me that too, Craig, because yeah. also you put a tax on people who leave, and that's also if 50% of people left, which is overestimating it. So it's clear that there is money left, and we saw that, as you've just uh, presupposed, with your question. We saw that in COVID. We saw Nightingale hospitals pop up everywhere, and that was good. We saw universal credit uplifted by £20. That was good. Those were political choices, and I'll applaud a political choice when it's the right political choice. Right now, we have political choices that are toxic, that are divisive, that are turning people against each other. We hear as if the workers are some amorphous blob that we don't understand. We're all the workers, the public are the workers. And it's really important that every single person in this country stands by these people who are striking. Because we know in the Green Party, unlike the other parties, unfortunately, and I do include Labour in this, that when people ask for solidarity, the only authentic response is to give it. Luciano. Labour been in a pretty, uh, well, robust row today about positions on strikes. Keir Starmer was treating effectively refusing to say what they would do on public sector pay. Isn't that a bit of a bit of a cop out from your old party? It's a point well made. I'm not a member of any party, <laughs> so I'm not here speaking on behalf of anyone. I think it's important that we look at the backdrop of, of how we've got to where we are today. We're seeing the the, the fastest drop in real wages on record. Uh, and that's across all sectors, but more pronounced in the public sector. And it's also exacerbated by the fact that we have a really severe recruitment and retention crisis, again, across all of the public sector. And if we look specifically at the NHS, for example, you know, the research that we saw out today from Labour, uh, that you know, p hospitals paying upwards of £5,000 for one shift for one locum doctor. It's completely absurd and ridiculous. And we just don't have the people because we haven't treated our public sector workers, particularly in the NHS, very well. And yet we all stood outside and applauded them when it came to the pandemic but actually you know th th there is a, a serious serious challenge and these are the people on the front line our key workers who are doing everything uh, to keep this nation well particularly when you know we, we're experiencing uh, in this winter uh, additional challenges like strep a for example so uh, ultimately it's incumbent on the government to get around the table and i was really disappointed to read on the way here that uh, you know there hasn't been able to there hasn't been able to uh, be a, a proper uh, assumption of discussions today when it comes to our nurses who do such an important job because uh, they, the, as I understand it, the health secretary didn't want to talk about wages today. Obviously, that's kind of the crux of the issue, but it's not just about that. And mm. we're not hearing about those wider issues. And it's not just about this moment in time. Obviously, people are feeling it in such a pronounced way when we've got inflation, at, uh, food inflation at over 16%. This is this is as a result of years and years um, of essentially kind of just wearing down our public services, wearing down our health service. And this is why we're in such a profound and challenging situation at this time. And, and I'm really disappointed to hear what's happened today with the government. What what do you make of Keir Starmer and West Streeting sort of taking on the unions a bit and they won't give in to their vested interests, their demands, banning shadow ministers from standing on the picket lines? It's a clear shift from Labour leaders of old. Is it a sensible one, do you think? Well, I reflect specifically what the comments were that I read of, uh, from the Shadow Health Secretary from West Streeting, specifically about the issue around primary care. So this is a you know, discussion about a, a vote that was passed about um, whether we should um, confine the opening hours of our GPs to between nine and five. I think there is a discussion to be had about I mean, sensible. calling the British Medical Association, which is the doctor's trade union, calling them the vested interest groups and they've been too dogmatic. Is that what people want to hear from Labour politicians? 
I think that there's vested interest in all groups. Um, but uh, And I think there's a, a really important and profound conversation to be had about how we shift what we have at the moment within our health service, which is a focus on what happens in hospitals, to bringing everything back into the community, to preventing ill health in the first place, to making sure that people can access GP appointments. I was in my office today, one of my co-workers was on the phone for like over 20 minutes just trying to get through to her GP mm. to make an appointment. And when she did so, she wasn't going to get one until into the new year. So you know, I think there's a discussion to be had with everyone about how we improve our health service and it's everyone's business it's not just the government's business um, um but at this time what's the most important thing what i'm hearing very cl clearly and very loudly from labor is that it's the government's responsibility to get around the table and that's not what we're seeing at this time james Yes, well, I think that, to uh, go back to Denise's original question, I mean, the difficulty here is two issues, I think. One is low pay uh, since the post-2008, and the other is inflation. And inflation, of course, makes everything scratchy, turns different employer groups against each other. Inflation running at 10% eats into people's wages. So I think the danger here, the, the question here is about how do we solve these longer-term issues facing the country? And we've already got difficult choices ahead of us in the sense that the tax burns at a 70-year high. Uh, people, I think, are paying a lot for in terms of spending but not getting results from public services. And so I think the longer-term question here on both sides is, is about growth. And the tragedy, I think, as Zach mentions, the, the Liz Truss government is that perhaps she had this focus on growth, but the solutions were wrong. And I think that, um, or perhaps mismanaged, shall we say. And I think that um, that's the key question that's going to be focusing over the, the next medium to long term period once we get through the short to medium term of the strikes that affect the country in December and January. So, uh, Craig, I want to put that point to you about the Trust government you were part of. It, the, as Zach said, you found tens of billions of pounds to be borrowed to fund tax cuts, national insurance, corporation tax. Ten billion pounds to be borrowed in that context to help nurses and the NHS through the winter. It's not it, much money, is it? it? It's apples and pears. <clears throat> uh, I mean, if, you, if you're funding short term for growth, so investors save, uh, then then that's exactly what the intention was, at least in, under the the, the the trust government. This is a ten billion pound year on year spend, uh, which grows every year because next year's r uh, rise will be on top of this year, year's rise as well. So, uh, you, you know th th that. It's not investing to save in the same way as investing for growth for the whole economy, uh, which in, in effect would produce the money to pay the £10 billion. Pounds. But isn't uh, part going to show? I was say, I mean, that's just looking at the figure in isolation of just one figure without looking at all the other factors around it. I mean, I can think of many factors, you know, in terms of you know, take, putting pay to one side and looking at this issue of recruitment and retention. If we don't invest in our nurses, they're going to stop being nurses. We've already seen that. We've but, but, got but, oh, we've got over a hundred thousand vacancies, we, in NHS, we, we, of which tens of thousands are in the nursing sector specifically. We have, but that that is because of the way the NHS currently sits. We've actually got more people working in our NHS now than we've ever had working. Uh, temporary uh, no, 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 it doesn't matter whether they're temporary or not. The reality is well, they, are work, the are but they are working in the NHS. That's, but, but that's not if okay, you look at but, all but, the support services, if you yeah, look at the decimation but, but, of health know, visitors, we, if you look at the reduction absolutely. in people that are working in, in our communities to keep people well in the but first place. Let, well, well, let's get our doctors open seven days a week so that actually people can go and see the doctors so they're not going to A&E and putting more, more stuff on, on, on the we, on We've got a massive GP recruitment crisis. Let's sort out our social... Social care. We need 10,000 uh, So more that GPs. we're not bed blocking with, uh, with with those people that should be going back out in the community to, to care. This isn't a one silver bullet fixes everything. And, and that point about social care is because we've seen a decimation in the investment in social care in this country over the past 10 years. We don't have the people that are going into people's homes to support them. We're not having councils able to afford to provide the lower level of support. But we're also spending more on social care than we ever have in our history. Uh, you know, we've seen more, more monetary investment than we've ever seen in my lifetime in social care. Can I suggest one policy, which I think is a really exciting moment? This is the idea of a 10 to 1 pay ratio. I just did a political slot about this on Channel 4, which is no one in any organisation should be paid 10 times more than the lowest paid worker. And I think what we're seeing, we're seeing this on the railways as well, is we're seeing workers whose wages are going down in terms of real terms. And we're seeing executives and bosses taking huge amounts in, in dividends and, and, and in pay. And I think it's clear that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. I think under the Tory government, we've seen champagne at the top, sewage for the rest of us. We've literally got rivers that are running with... Oh, come on. Well, it's true. You know, oh. Even the environment agency <laughs> oh, says. To be fair, I think, I think that people will have something to say about the £12 million in dividends that went out to Avanti uh, shareholders yesterday, which is the worst performing operator in this country. I mean, there, there is some examples of where... Right, and is yeah. the sewage oh, in the water or not? Come back in Sorry, you're getting yeah, it on both the, sides, no, but, but there is sewage but, 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 in no, There's always been sewage in our water. But it's our, been much our worse. Rivers, our rivers are much cleaner now than they've been in my lifetime. That's just absolutely And I'm older than you. No, it is true. We even have a seal that sits on the boy outside the House of Commons 
salmons in the Thames. That would never happen 20 years ago. I mean, ago, the Environment Agency, who are a so, government agency, yeah. I chair the Environment Committee in London, talk yeah. about the state of London's rivers, and we know that they're some of the better rivers so, sometimes. So, so you're saying you're saying our rivers are, are not cleaner than they've they've been in, the, in, in for many, many years? I'm saying that we've got urgency no, no. and are a crisis you, are going Are you on. saying our, our rivers are not cleaner than they've been for many years? Yes, we have sewage issues all, all over right. the UK okay. yeah. in our all rivers, right. and it's not right that we started talking about in the rivers. No. We started talking about nurses, Absolutely. we finished talking about seals. I don't know how we got there. <laughs> and more on strikes in just a moment. Keep your questions coming in. 0345 606 973. It's 817. LBC. At Specsavers, if we said you can... Conversation. Cross question. Tweet at LBC. 8.19 at the time. Just a reminder, with me uh, here in the studio are Zach Polanski from the Green Party, the Conservative MP uh, Craig Whitaker, uh, former Liberal Democrat Change UK and Labour MP Luciana Berger, and diary editor of The Spectator, James Heal. Uh, Mark has texted another question about strikes and pay. We will move on. Uh, but Mark's question's important too. Mark says, does the panel agree that nurses and other public sector workers should be offered a flat rate pay rise based on 10% of median earnings. I think this would help those on lower incomes, says Mark. Luciana, is that a good idea? I do think that more needs to be done to help those that are at the lower end of the pay scales. Um, certainly we know that's the case for um, many people in the NHS that um, are just starting out a training or in their kind of earlier years, uh, often doing some of the hardest jobs on the front line in the NHS. Um, I think any, any agreement that can be reached that can um, disproportionately positively support those people that I pay, particularly when we're like hearing some really challenging stories about how people are having to like choose this Christmas whether they pay for their housing costs or whether they put food on the tables and they're going out with them and going without meals and, and that's millions of people um, then yes absolutely we should tackle the the scourge of low pay and make sure that people are earning a proper living wage rather than um, you know what was what's called a living wage but isn't a living wage according to the living wage mm. foundation so I would definitely support that in order to be able to achieve that everyone needs to get around the table and again obviously we talked about it just a moment ago but it's incumbent on government to lead the way and bring people together and have that discussion and negotiation on pain and we've established already so mm. far that that's not the case when it comes mm. to our nurses striking this thursday mark's talking about 10 percent of median incomes that sounds like a pretty hefty pay rise to me possibly even bigger than the the 19 percent that nursing unions are asking for why is 19 percent unaffordable craig well, it's, it's massively over and above uh, a very high inflation rate to start with, um, which, uh, which you know, is difficult. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm more in favour, personally. I mean, I'll just go back to what Zach said earlier on. You know, if you give nur nurses a 19% pay rise, then you've got to give doctors a 19% pay rise, and that, very, that, uh, dis that disproportionately grows the wage gap. 
uh, which, which is unacceptable. This is my view on what should happen, uh, not Conservative Party or indeed the government's view, but I, I think there's a very strong case uh, for doing a one-off payment for the lower paid, mm. uh, particularly a little bit like we're doing with the, um, uh, you know, the winter fuel yes. uh, payments. Within the NHS? Or uh, uh, well, public sector, because, public it, you, know, public, you know, it's not just the NHS that has poor, uh, poorly paid people. Um, uh, as a you know, as a proportion of, of the workforce, so I think there's a, a, a real. Uh, we need to have a real good, solid look at doing something as a one-off, so then it doesn't, uh, you know, build up as time progresses as well. Do you think Steve Barclay, in, in that case, is is wrong to say the health secretary that he's not even going to enter in discussions with the unions about pay? This is where I disagree with uh, Luciana because it's not for it's not for the government to enter into those uh, discussions. That's why we have an independent pay review body. It's not just for nurses, but for a whole raft of civil servants, uh, and that's very very important uh, that you have that independence that that makes recommendations to government. Government, of course, don't have to take uh, take on those recommendations. Well, they've, they've ignored them before, haven't they? Uh, they have. Really uh, uh, so absolutely. Steve Barclay could do the same. He could do, but he hasn't done. And what he's done is he's taken on fully what the independent pay review body has uh, suggested. Uh, and I think that's uh, once you start getting into uh, you basically si- sideline. The, the, the whole point of having an independent pay review body is to negotiate between government and, and the sector. Um, so, uh, so I think Steve on this occasion is uh, doing absolutely the right thing. James, the, the politics of this, mm. these strikes that we're going to see pretty getting pretty close to a general strike in the coming weeks, millions of workers expected to walk out. How big a problem do you think that could pose for the government politically? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I think that this government particularly came in under Rishi Sunak and states reputation on competence and being, I think, much more returned to normalcy. So um, I think that does pose some kind of challenge. I think the question, though, that I think that the Craig sort of touches upon is I think, you know, the, um, politicians talk about the independent pay review body. Um, and I think there's a reluctance here for politicians on both sides to kind of get involved with the nitty gritty of individual because then you start negotiating between politics and um, the independent sectors and I think Labour have had this holding line about not refusing to be drawn into detail so they refuse to say they're back 19% but it would somehow be higher than 7.5% um, and I think that shows kind of reluctance really to uh, get too involved but partly because Labour needs to sort of distance itself from some of the recent past about its links to uh, unions but also I think that you know the Tories I think there's a much more softly, softly approach than perhaps we saw maybe 30 years ago of course from the famous 80s you know when it was about the authority of the state which is at stake so although it is a lot of strikes at one at any one time, I would say it's a bit different from perhaps a general strike in that I don't think it's necessarily so much a political question as an economic one. Oops, thank you. Uh, Zach, is 19% unaffordable, as Keir Starmer says? I think anything's affordable when it becomes your priority. So when the GMB asked for a 15% pay rise, I was really pleased that the Green Party backed that. Ultimately, though, I think this is about leadership and it is about the government getting around the table. But we've seen this government, they're out of ideas, they're out of touch and they're out of time. But also the Labour opposition, we've had Keir Starmer saying that governments in waiting don't go on picket lines. I've been really proud to be out and about on picket lines almost every day during some of these strikes. And the reason why I've been doing that is not that it's performative, but actually if you're a government in waiting or you're any elected politician, it is your duty to be there to listen to people. And the idea that someone who is going to be a future government can't spend the time listening to the people who are out there making our country work, who are you, out there. You don't, oh, come on. <laughs> you don't have to be on the picket line to listen that's to people. There's, 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 there's so many ways in, the... which we, in which MPs and, and shadow ministers and leaders engage, whether it's going to conferences, whether it's speaking to your own and meeting your own constituents. Uh, all the work that has to be done in Parliament is getting out and speaking in the media. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of raft of things. I agree entirely. So all of those things are important and any politician should be doing those. Being on a picket line with people who are in a very particular context, who want to see politicians and speak to them in that context, is a really important part of the democratic process. And we've seen this Conservative government are rolling back the rights for union strikers, along with their awful protest rights and criminalising our right to essentially express ourselves. And the Labour Party should be front and centre defending those rights, but actually they've been completely missing off the table. So I'm really <coughs> pleased once again that the Green Party, that we are out there on the picket lines and we're there to defend people's rights. Just, That's not all of politics, but it's a really important part of politics. I just reinforce, I'm not here on behalf of any party, but I'm certainly hearing from the Labour Party some very practical ideas about how they generate the income necessary to pay for things like increased pay for nurses. That takes time and energy kind of in terms of working on the policy behind the scenes. There's loads of things that are going on. You know, I think the idea that you have to be there on the picket line, I mean, there's there's certainly the MPs that are, but um, the idea that that in itself kind of, it shows your solidarity with workers. It's coming out of the practical ideas and having the the innovation and thought and policy that's actually going to make a difference to this country 
issue, at least which at least we are hearing from the opposition, which we're certainly not hearing from government at this time. Well, I think it's both. It's not either or. So you both create the practical ideas like insulate every home in Britain, make sure we're investing in renewables, make sure that we're making that green fair transition with all industries. And it's being out there on the picket lines. It's not either or. You can do both. And that's what the Labour Party seem to not get. They seem to think that if you're on the picket line, you can't be doing serious politics. Picket lines are a really important part of our democratic process. And we should always be there to stand up for them. Just Craig, briefly, Zach says, you was it out of touch, out of time, out of ideas? Something well, like that. you know, just, just, just for the record, and just to back Luciano up on this one, I mean, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to go do an overnight shift in A&E, my local A&E. That's how I stay in touch with what my uh, constituents feel about various parts of the sectors. Last Friday, I was out, I visited uh, six different businesses, and uh, high street businesses, uh, you, you know, th there's a whole variety of things. So, no, we're not this out of brilliant, touch. but maybe you should go visit a picket line too, I'm sure they'd love to hear. Yeah, them. yeah, I'm sure that'll be. Do you have ever been on a awesome. picket line crew? Um, no, I don't think I have. Ever? No. First, first time now? No. 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 No plans. No. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I can just, I could just put on Twitter and then see what a picket line's like, I and mean, you know, it's the same thing. People, he who shouts loudest gets uh, supposedly heard, uh, and that, that, that's what I would. It's the opposite uh, on picket lines. I'm not talking about the shouting. I'm talking about you can genuinely go and engage with people, ask them why they're there. Yeah, but just say, but just say politicians don't engage with people is just ridiculous. I never said that. Uh, I said that's a way of engaging well, well, with people. I mean, but it's a really well. It is a part, way, right? but it is a way you choose, but I don't. Right. I think what and we're think also hearing from the opposition, in which we're not hearing for government, is, is how they would get around the table. I think that's an important starting point, which would make a you know, very significant change. What we're not hearing from the Labour Party and that we are hearing from government is about calling up the army to somehow kind of replace public services. That's not what the army's in place for. But what are they meant to do, Lucia? Someone's got to drive the, paramed the ambulances. If paramedics go on strike, it, but isn't we it have better got, to have the be army getting, there helping out? We should moment? be getting to that point. And they're doing on yeah, two yeah, or three yeah. days training. It's not appropriate. Well, well, that's not, no, 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 come on. The, there are people in our army that are qualified para paramedics, doctors, but our army is not. And, and, <laughs> and our, our army is not trained my, 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 to stand at my, our borders and our airports and, my, and check people's passports. Well, well we're, talk we're talking about ambulances here. My daughter was in the army and, and did exactly right. just that. So to say she's not qualified or trained, like all the other people that work in that sector in the army, is just just pure ridiculous. Well, I don't think it's ridiculous. I think the point is that our public services should be run by the people who are there to, to do that. Well, you that. were saying they weren't trained, be... is what you said. Well, I'm saying that... The... And you said they only get three days training. That's not true. Keep misrepresenting me. There will be people no, that's what you said. who are driving ambulances who aren't necessarily trained. I didn't say none of them are trained. Of course, you will get some people who are trained, and I hope they're the first who will step forward. But there will be people, if the military come forward, doing jobs that are not fully trained to do those jobs, who will do a two, three-day training course, be doing a vital job, and that's not appropriate. That's a government that's failed. Craig, is it just briefly, is it a bit embarrassing that the government's having to call in the army to do all sorts of jobs because public sector workers have gone on strike? I don't, in I don't think it's embarrassing at all. I, I think, you know, there has to be some, uh, you know, recognition that some of the demands that are being asked for are just, you know, unaffordable. And like I said, to start with, you can you can ask for whatever you, you, you can have, whatever you want. But, how uh, does but you've end? got to pay for it's it. It's a negotiation. You obviously have two ends of respect. Well, that's, what, that's, why we have the, that's why we have the independent pay review bodies that do exactly Frank, just how that. How does this end, though, unless the government is willing to concede in some areas? Is this just going to go well, on? Well, there will be some concessions at some point along the way. Of course there will be. So why not just <clears> get them out the way early and avoid a lot of chaos? Um, well, I'm, I'm not. It's way above my pay grade uh, to to start negotiation on behalf of the government. I'm not even, you know, a government minister. But uh, you know, those those discussions will be being had behind the scenes, uh, and uh, and there's a whole variety of things. But I, don't, I, you know, I go back to what I said. I don't think it is the government's role to sit around a table with a particular sector to negotiate. That's exactly I, I why you have the independent pay review bodies. If you if you bypass that system, you actually get a democratic system that breaks down. Okay, just very do, briefly. Can I just say, I, very, do, I, yeah. I do think it's the government's responsibility to, to ensure that we preserve life. Uh, and when it comes to like the NHS, and um, well, there's already 7 million people waiting for a, a, an operation in this country, and the fact that people will not be able to get an ambulance in the way that they should be doing, and they're, and they're not doing it so already, and that's what's going to be happening. I think, again, that is the responsibility of the government to step up and engage in negotiating. James, just briefly, do you think ministers are going to have to cave on this at some point to put an end to the chaos that we're going to see? I mean, I think there'll be some kind of concessions along the way, and I think it'll be very difficult. I think the key thing is the difference between, say, NHS workers, which I think the public has a lot more... Uh, 
uh, empathy and uh, sympathy with um, after the pandemic than other sectors perhaps. So I think it'll be interesting to see if that changes, whether the overall public perceptions will change as well. Can I agree with Craig on something? Because we piled on him. The one-off payment, <laughs> not a one-off payment, but let's have a universal basic income. Let's protect some of the poorest people. That's not society. agreeing. <laughs> well, yeah. That's a, a totally payment. different policy. Well, you can't say you agree and then propose a totally different policy. It's right. It's very creative. Lots more to come on this. Do keep your questions coming in. 03456060973. More uh, to come in just a moment. First, let's get the latest news headlines from Serena Farrow. The Royal College of Nursing says the Health Secretary refused to discuss pay demands during talks earlier. General Secretary Pat Cullen says she expressed her deep disappointment, adding Steve Barclay had little to say ahead of this week's strikes. No one else has been reported missing following the deaths of three boys who fell through a freezing lake near Birmingham. A fourth boy, who's six years old, is still in a critical condition in hospital. And a lab technician's been found guilty of the murder of his work colleague at his parents' home in Leicestershire. 30 year old Ross McCullum had admitted the manslaughter of Megan Newborough, claiming he suffered from undiagnosed PTSD. LBC, where they're staying mainly dry for Wales and most of England tonight. The odd shower in Northern Ireland, though, with a low of at least minus seven degrees. This is LBC. <laughs> Question on LBC. Text 84850. 8.35 the time now. Ben Kentish here on LBC. Joining me in the studio for tonight's cross question are Craig Whitaker, a Conservative MP for Calder Valley, Luciana Berger, Chair of the Maternal Mental Health Alliance, and of course, former MP, James Heal, the diary editor of The Spectator and co author of the book Out of the Blue, and Zach Polanski, the deputy leader of the Green Party of England. Right, our and next Wales. question. And Wales. <laughs> I've demoted you, Zach. Sweeted. Apologies. <laughs> uh, let's go to our next questioner, who is Jake in Orpington. Jake, good evening. Hi, yeah, good evening, Ben. Thank you for taking my call, and uh, good evening, panel. Um, having, having slept on the streets for four years, and with the cold snap that we're having now, what is being done for the homeless people? Because there seems to be a lot of talk about everybody, me, 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 I want, I want, and I totally get it. But what's actually being done for the homeless people? Because I've done a little bit of looking into it, and there's no sort of night shelters that are being opened up. And I know there's warm hubs during the day, but I'm 
talking about the weather that's going on out there at the moment. And it's going to get colder before it gets better. Mm. And okay. what's been done for the homeless people, basically. Jack, I'm glad you asked it. We're going to be talking about it in a lot more detail from nine, but it's a really important issue. Zach, big issue in London. You're a London Assembly member. Uh, what is being done and what more needs to be done in your view? It's a huge issue and no one should have to spend any night um, either asleep on the street or even uh, couch surfing and lots of people who are homeless don't necessarily get counted in the statistics because we know there's lots of overcrowding going on and, uh, and all sorts of other practices. Essentially what we need to do is make sure that there are enough homes for everyone and I know that sounds like a really obvious statement but sometimes I think in these conversations those things get missed. So there's a, there's a few key things there. When we say enough homes for everyone, the home has to be of a decent standard. We're in a cost of living crisis and we know that if your home isn't insulated then your energy bills are rocketing. The cheapest bill is essentially the one you don't have to pay because you've got an insulated home. So we need to make sure in those places where we are building more homes or where we're retrofitting homes that we're doing it properly and to a decent standard. One thing we've been doing a lot of in London and we need to stop immediately is knocking down homes and, and putting new buildings up there, but often the buildings are unaffordable. One, that's really bad for embodied carbon. That's for carbon within the building. So that's terrible for the environment because you're destroying it, sending all those carbon emissions and then rebuilding a home. But second, it's actually a complete lack of imagination in Paris, there's been some really interesting uh, pieces of work recently architecturally where they've taken old estates and things like that, retrofitted them, made them more beautiful and actually put more people into them. So I think we need a really different attitude uh, to the way that, that we get homes for people. And then finally, you can't have this conversation without talking about Margaret Thatcher's failed policy and the fact that we sold off all of those council homes. Essentially, social housing has to be there for everyone, has to be provided. And I know that there'll often be talks about long waiting lists, but again, that's often pitting the most vulnerable people against the most vulnerable people. We need to have a positive story about migration, positive story about refugees and asylum seekers and make sure the infrastructure is there. That means homes, doctors, um, infrastructure and transport. All of those things can happen. And when people say they can't or they're unaffordable, once again, that's a result of political choices. And everyone having a home to live in has to be a fundamental human right. Craig, is that the right approach? Craig Whittaker? The one thing I will agree with Zach on is the fact that actually you have, before we can have a sensible conversation about all the things that he said, you have to have a de decent infrastructure. And infrastructure doesn't come overnight. So that's the first thing. And, and the people we're talking about, those that are sleeping on the streets, aren't the ones that want council houses. What they need is incredible amounts of help, whether it's uh, mental health, whether it's uh, from drug abuse, alcoholism, wh whatever it is. If you go and talk to the people on the streets in London, uh, as, as I do, uh, and, uh, and indeed um, in, in other parts, uh, what, what they need is real help. Uh, there is a long-term uh, uh, strategy from the government on homelessness, um, uh, and in fact, if, if, you're a, if you're a vet and homeless, um, the, the aim is to have all vets off the streets by 2024. Uh, but it's not that simple. That, that, that needs a whole heap of um, uh, determination, money. Uh, we're not, well, we're not talking about homes. We're talking about shelter started because we've got to get them physically off the streets first. Right. I mean, you can't take them physically off the streets in some of the states that they're in and put them straight into a council house. For example, what we needed is shelters for them. There aren't enough shelters around London, and this is your responsibility being a, a London Assembly. Well, it's my responsibility uh, to scrutinise the mayor, so it's the mayor's responsibility. But, 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 you're, you're, but, but, but look, you're a London... You, you can't... You know, as politicians, you, you can't beat up somebody when you're part of that process... Uh, for not me, Gov, it's somebody else. Actually, you're, up. The you're, London Assembly is a scrutiny body, so well, it's a different body to what you do, which is a legislative No, I, under I understand that. But, but, I take my responsibility but, 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 seriously. But we all have to take responsibility. Okay, all right. But we all have to, all have to take responsibility for it. It's not about building council houses. It's uh, In the longer term, it is. But in the short ah. term, what it is, is about getting those people off the streets and into refuges and getting them the help they need, whether it's mental health, whether it's for alcohol. But the alcohol outcome here isn't to have everyone in refuges. The, the outcome here is to have everyone in a home. Okay. Longer term, but short, right. short term. Let's get them off the street to start with. Absolutely, but and, then but let's you get can't them in do, the home. But you can't do that in London if you don't have refugees, and you don't have ref refugees to help. Would you, Craig? Them. Would you agree that we're not building anywhere near enough homes to solve this problem in the long run? Oh, oh it's a huge problem, and this is, we go back to what we were saying before. You, you know, the, the government have been. Uh, uh, I'd go as far as saying, with particular uh, private landlords, they've been anti-private landlords for uh, you know fifteen, twenty years. Oh, if you go and talk to your citizen advice bureau locally, as I did a couple of weeks ago in the Calder Valley, number two on their problem is landlords selling homes. Uh, 
uh, they want to get out of being private landlords because it's it's just not worth doing. So they, they're selling these homes. So there's actually less homes for people to rent. Our councils aren't building homes. Our social housing aren't building enough homes. Um, and, and the problem is getting worse, not better. I mean, why do you think we had to have, you know, the homes for Ukraines? Because we have no homes to put them. Why do you think we have 143,000 young men in hotels in virtually every constituency in the Calder Valley, uh, sorry, in the country, not just the Calder Valley, um, that, are, that are waiting to be processed uh, because we don't have homes to put them in? But he's been in government for the last 12 yeah, no, years. No, no, but, but this isn't a 12-year issue. This is, this is an ongoing situation that you have to have the infrastructure in place before you can deal but with these things. you did say things. it's getting worse, not better, Craig. Under, well, it under is. Your government. Oh, oh, it is getting worse. But you know, un- under the last Labour government, they didn't build any social housing at all. In fact, they ripped so they it all started down. it, and you've done nothing about it. Is that well, basically? Well, no, yeah? we have built, but we don't build enough. And and you know, you, you've you've got to strip it back. You've got to go back to things like the planning uh, system, which is appalling, and uh, and uh, you know, it takes forever uh, to get to get a small extension, okay. let alone build an estate of uh, social housing. Luciana, is it very timely? discussion point because there's the crisis research out today that shows that an additional one million people are facing eviction from their homes this winter so we already see on our streets the stain i think is i think it's a stain on the national conscience to see the increase in people that have that are sleeping on our streets and i've been in a number of cities just over the course of the past few months and seen for myself the, the very visible uh, increase in the, in the in the visible homelessness and that doesn't include people that uh, as we've heard uh, you know either uh, in a crowded accommodation or sofa surfing don't perhaps come on the official mm. statistics of, home, of homelessness but are really struggling to get by so um, I, I don't want to live in a country where we're seeing increasing numbers of, of homeless people i want i want <laughs> us to be able to do something to make sure that we don't see that particularly in these acute cold winter months. There's some very practical things that the government can do. They could uh, ensure that every area um, has is able but gets the direct funding to contend with a challenge in in in, the, in uh, individual cities. That isn't the case at the moment. Um, certainly where I was an MP in Liverpool, you know, the Liverpool City Council did everything that it possibly could to, to uphold the no second night policy that no one should be sleeping a second night rough um, on the street. Um, but again, that was doing it on a shoestring. Um, and despite, you know, so many people's best efforts, kind of relying on charity and volunteers, you know, there just wasn't enough resource. Um, you know, and part of the challenge has also been kind of the disproportionate impact on those areas with high levels of dep- deprivation, where we've seen councils who are at the forefront of, of dealing with this issue, not being, you know, just not having the funds to, to be able to contend with it. So it's not just about money, and there are kind of wider societal and social challenges and issues, but it's very, very visible. Uh, and again, I think, you know, I think you know people want a government that's going to tackle it and actually do something and, and not just say all oh, the numbers are rising, but actually do everything to eliminate it altogether. James, what do you think needs to be done? Well, I mean, I was, I was going to say, I think that, you know, this winter with the snow today, I wonder if that will be one thing with political potency that's going to cut through is seeing those images of people homeless in this kind of weather. But um, you know, I was just reflecting on, I remember at the start of the pandemic, there was um, a great effort to try and get some of the homeless into more per- sort of permanent shelters. And it's just a, a shame that, understandably, uh, for kind of political uh, bandwidth and the, the focus of Westminster sort of moved on elsewhere, it's just a shame. And I think that shows that the kind of short-term investment isn't enough and that often it's the pressure elsewhere in the system. Really long-term is, is the planning system and and housing, but also things like the NHS, etc. And those kind of pressures get put on the front line. People end up homeless. And um, honestly, uh, I think was his name John. Sorry, you know, I have my sympathies. Jake. Jake. Jake, Jake James, sorry, my sympathies. It's Christmas time. Okay, Jake. Thank you for your question. James in Ayrshire is next. James, what's your question? Uh, Hi. Uh, good evening, Ben, and good evening to your guest. Evening. Uh, my my question is a very a very short one. Um, will there ever ever be any meaningful reform of the House of Lords? <laughs> Will there ever be any meaningful reform of the House of Lords? Luciana Berger, should there be? Um, should there be? I, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a suite of policies that uh, any new government might want to look at to uh, improve... Um, this, you know, people, sta- you know, politics standing in this country, and it's, you know, it's fair to say um, that it has been decimated over recent years. And uh, I, I see a report out today that shows, uh, a, you know, a proportion of the public want to see uh, more to hold uh, politicians to account and to hold them to the standards that you expect of them uh, in office. Um, Do you think it serves a function, though, the House of Lords, in its in its current form? Um, I certainly, uh, from my experience of serving in the House of Commons for. for 
just shy of 10 years, um, reflect very positively on some of the experts who are currently in the House of Lords and the really important job that they do, bringing their expertise of decades um, in the sectors that they've come from to scrutinise our legislation. Um, that is a separate issue to the fact that we've seen um, recent governments kind of literally kind of ram it full of... Um, you know, people that are their friends and their mates uh, and to kind of swell the ranks to make sure that there isn't any uh, proper, I think, scrutiny or that there's no chance of, you know, um, certainly if I kind of reflect on the difference between the government in 2010 and, and towards the, you know, what we see today, that there there wasn't the opportunity to have those um, meaningful votes that could result in actually changes to legislation because it's just voting fodder is, is how it kind of seems at this moment in time. So I think um, in, in spirit, there's, there's some positive elements and certainly we should have have a scrutinising chamber. Um, I mean, there are discussions about, you know, um, voting for people to be elected to, to, in, in, in that role, and, and I kind of welcome that conversation. Yeah, Labour's calling for a fully elected House, yeah. isn't it? We will hear from James, from Zach, and from Craig on that question in just a moment. It's 8.46. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Labour's Sir Keir Starmer here taking your calls. Kirst is in Gurrock in Scotland. Where do you stand on the issue of the strikes with nurses? I want to see this resolved. I want to see the government around. I I think 19% is more than can be afforded by the government. But I would get around the table and negotiate something that works for both sides. Where's Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary? He said that we need to be aware that the NHS is a service, not a shrine. And it, the NHS, needs to reform or die. Do you concur? Uh, Yeah, we've got to reform the NHS. NHS going forward. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Question on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. is the time. With me in the studio for Cross Questions, uh, the Green Pasties, a deputy leader for England and Wales, Zach Polanski, (laughs) a Conservative MP for the Quarter Valley, Craig Whitaker, uh, diary editor of The Spectator, James Heal, and Luciana Berger, who as well as being a former MP is also now Chief Executive of In-House Communications. Uh, We were talking a moment ago about the House of Lords, James and Ayrshire asking whether there would be ever, would be serious reform of the House of Lords. Uh, Zach Polanski, 
Should they be? It will they be? Well, I think this is one of the most important questions you can ask tonight. And I think often the public don't attune to questions about the House of Lords or about the voting systems that we use to elect people. But actually, all of these things are about how the country is run. So when we're talking about strikers, work, striking workers or homeless people, really how people represent us is at the core of that. And right now, we have a broken voting system, a first pass for post in this country. There's only two countries in Europe who use this system, the UK and Belarus, which is literally a corrupt dictatorship. So I think it's really time that we lose first pass for post. And it's pretty dire that this Conservative government have taken us from proportional representation okay, to first House pass of Lords. Post. To the question, though, to the House of Lords. But m my point really here is that Keir Starmer started talking about the House of Lords, but I think it's a big distraction. We need to be talking that's about what the question was proportional about, representation that. for House That's of what Lords. the question was about. James and Ayrshire wants to know, will there ever be meaningful reform in the House of Lords? Um, we badly need meaningful reform in the House of Lords, and I'd look to abolish it in terms of having an unelected bishop uh, running the country and scrutinising things does not make sense. I think there is room for a scrutiny chamber and I think there is good work happening in the House of Lords now, so it's not to kind of dismiss so what, all the work that people... You'd have it wholly elected or...? Yeah, so I think wholly elected, and we could look at a proportional element, but I think all of those conversations need to come later after you've gone to the House of Commons first and made sure you've got proportional representation for the House okay. of Commons. Okay, Craig, uh, what's good, do you uh, think? Uh, well, first of all, the biggest referendum we had in this country, or well, the second biggest, uh, was actually on AV, and the, the British public absolutely rejected it by 72% out. So, Which is good, though, it's so not it's proportional. Okay, so House of Lords reform. On House of Lords reform. I... Um, I don't think I've had one email, one conversation, one telephone call, one letter from any one of my constituents that say this should be a priority. Because you've not uh, been on the picket lines. Uh, because I've not been on the picket lines, of course. <laughs> Sorry to go. Um, so in, in the mix of priorities, I can't see it happening forever. I know, I know the Labour Party have said that they would put it on, on, on the, in their manifesto and on their agenda, but in the priority of what needs to be done, I think it's very low down the list. Do you think it does need reform? I think, I think it needs some form of reform. I, 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 I go in swings and roundabouts about on this one. I, I mean, like Luciano, when, when you work with Lords, the expertise that they have is mm. you could never replicate under a, uh, a, a voted system. Um, and there, are, you know, because you normally, if we're doing a health bill, you get all the health experts coming in, you get an education uh, bill, you tend to get all the educationists coming in, whatever it is. Um, and I think that's a unique uh, system. Uh, but it does need reforming. I think there's too many. I think um, the, I think at one time when the Lib Dems were looking at uh, uh, that in, in, in the coalition days, I think they were talking in the region of 300 working lords or something. I can't, don't quote me on the figure, but whatever it was. So I think, I think things like that, an age limit. I'm talking about working lords. There's nothing wrong with keeping... Uh, a lord as a as a gong as a as an honour, um, but from physical working lord in the House of Lords, um, I, I think we can do reform. James Hill. Well, I mean, I think I mean, Keir Starmer when he announced these plans next week, last week, was talking about people wanting to be empowered. And I think that we've discussed tonight the number of different crises facing the British state. I think people want to feel empowered by getting public services that work rather than having a two-year-long constitutional crisis as this would be, using up huge amounts of political capital. And I think we've had a little bit tonight of how the difficulties of, you understand what the problem is, you know what the, what the uh, House Laws issue is, it's undemocratic, fine. Okay, how do you go and solve that? And that becomes the next debate. Um, you know, we talk about proportional reform, uh, proportional representation. Well, if that is PR elected, that is in a bicameral system that is going to take power away from the House of Commons. And I'm yet to meet many MPs who are willingly going to give power away out of the chamber to someone else uh, just down the corridor. I think, you know, it was a good point that Craig was just talking about now about the expertise. Earlier we were discussing homelessness. You know, John Bird, the founder of the big issues in the House of Lords, a member, yeah. number of peers with disability issues, whole different range of expertise. And that will change, change forever. And uh, the House of Lords will not give way so much uh, the more that it becomes sort of an elected element, as we saw post-1999 with the House of Lords reform. So it's a very difficult question, and I don't think any government has any really stomach for that, particularly after the last five, six years on the Brexit wars. So you think, in short, no is the answer to the question? I, I think that no, it no won't report. happen. And I think it would be more likely some small tweaks, like the steel bill a few years ago. James, what do you think? Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding of the structure of the United Kingdom, which is, a, which is a union of four equal nation states. Reform of the House of Lords is an ability to actually have equal representation of four of, of these four nation states of the United Kingdom. Gordon Brown has some very good ideas around this. OK, James, thank you for your question. That's James in Ayrshire. Let's go to Abdul in Leicester. Abdul, hi, what's your question? 
Hi. Um, first of all, before the question, a quick one. Um, on my condolences to the families of the f- three children who have sadly yeah, lost their absolutely. lives. Yeah. Uh, you know, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, heartfelt condolences. I mean, it's heart wrenching. But I mean, well said, as, as far as yeah, as far as the foreign policy is concerned, you know, I think it leaves much to be decided. I think we should stop meddling in other countries. Don't the panel think that you know? First of all, we should learn from Iraq. We should learn from Afghanistan. And at the same time, you know, I mean, I don't say this, but even if we look at the IDF former soldiers who left the IDF in Israel, they themselves say, I mean, many of them say that we Abdul, actually... What's, put, what's, your, what's your question, Abdul? My question is, should, shouldn't we stop, stop supporting people who are doing the oppressing in, in parts, in like, like in Israel? So, so less, less intervention in other parts of the world? Yes, less intervention and less meddling. Where you know, okay, we, we okay, do, we okay, can't okay, do... okay. Thank you, Abdul. Can I come to the panel, uh, Craig Whitaker? Do we need to be a bit more focused on our own issues and less on other uh, countries? Look, the, the the international stuff is incredibly important. Uh, I mean, we've had lots of discussions around foreign aid, for example, um, and how that's used over the uh, since I came in in twenty two, well, and prior to that as well. But in in twenty ten, we've seen this huge debate around how how that does, and, and actually, the soft power that that gives us as a nation is immense. Uh, you know, you talk about things like education for 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 young girls. You talk about uh, uh, you know. I, I, I was in the Gambia earlier on in the year uh, talking to the Gambian um, assembly members uh, about domestic abuse and, and, uh, and those types of things. So that soft power, even if it's like, you know, putting that seed in there, um, helps change uh, things for the better. And, and, and we know it also stops, uh, it's, it stops terrorism. It stop, well, helps stop terrorism. And, uh, and you know, education's a, a, a great thing. And we invest heavily uh, around that. And that's basically our, our foreign policy. This is after Foreign Secretary James cleverly, of course, today said that Britain needs to look beyond the comfort blanket of our traditional European and North American allies. Will that be contentious, James, do you think, or is that just common sense from the Foreign Secretary? Well, it's common sense to an extent, but I think we'll still let's see any sort of meat on the bones. I mean, um, James Clefferty has been banging the drum talking about doing more stuff with Africa. Fine, fantastic, but only a few months ago we had Foreign Secretary Liz Truss talking about a network of liberty. So I think it's much more about consistency. What I would say, just to go back on the original question, I think was the big foreign intervention of this year was, you know, Ukraine and Britain's support there. And I'm not sure anyone in Westminster would be questioning that. I think obviously now we're sort of reaping the, political, the, the difficulties of that in terms of the uh, energy costs we're feeling now but yet still I think across party in Westminster you know 99% of MPs would support it and so I'm not really sure when it comes to you know support standing up against tyranny in Eastern Europe we should be uh, questioning that anytime soon. Zach? Yes, uh, less intervention, I think, with exceptions. So I think Ukraine is an exception where the government were right to intervene and were right to to, um, arm the Ukrainians to be able to defend their country. I think a second aspect of this is actually the climate crisis, though. We know that a lot of these wars and conflicts that are happening are often about scarce resources. And actually, I think we need to uh, live up to our global responsibilities around climate, make sure we're reducing our emissions and also building a resilient country ourselves, because ultimately we're going to see a lot more climate refugees as the years and decades go by. And actually that's gonna cause increasing conflict in in some of the areas of the world. So I think as little intervention as possible, but actually, yes, there are times when we need to get involved. And lastly, Luciana. I think we have a responsibility to play our part on the global stage. Uh, I think this country has a proud history of uh, looking outwards and not just to our European neighbours, but beyond that. I think there's some really important roles and responsibilities we can and should assume. And I would agree, you know, most recently, kind of the role that we've played in supporting Ukraine has been, you know, critical and, and has shown some leadership. Um, uh, that that I that you know that 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 very serious issue continues. It's not in any way resolved, but we have a responsibility and we should live up to that responsibility. And I'd also agree uh, when it comes to the climate crisis also that uh, as a country we can't act in isolation and particularly in the wake of Brexit again we can't just rely on our European neighbours we've got a role to look further afield when it comes to intervening there's a whole discussion about what that means um, but I want us to be leaders on the global stage. Uh, Abdul, thank you for your question. Our final text question comes from Alice in Plymouth. Alice says, poor Harry Kane missing that crucial penalty. (laughs) What's the worst thing which has happened to you while a pretty large group of people have been watching. Who shall I put on the spot here first? Zach, go on. Um, so before I was in politics, I was an actor, um, and I can remember times on stage where you just dry, and one time being in a Shakespearean play and having to make up five minutes of Shakespeare while several hundreds of people watched. So I think that was How pretty... quickly did people realise that you were completely making it um, up? I was about to say, I think I pulled it off, but then I'm worried that reflects I... on me as a politician. I, 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 I'm sure someone realised that. Uh, James? 
Well, I, mine's also football related, and uh, I was school goalkeeper, and I was known as the Achilles heel for the week. <laughs> uh, and I did. I sort of. I remember once committing a horrendous foul, and I sort of just punched a striker in the face and uh, got sent. You punched myself. a striker. I missed that. I was going for the ball, obviously, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> I, was, I was the first person to ever get a red card for my school. Ooh. All equally horrific, totally accidental, two-footed lunge. <laughs> hit her. Uh, Luciana. Um, I used to have an involuntary shaky leg. Um, when I would do public speaking. So my first time at the dispatch box in the House of Commons, I had to stand on my foot because it was shaking so bad. To stand on your foot? Yeah. Great. Right. Uh, great. So colleagues could see behind, you know, that I had this, <laughs> this shaky leg. Uh, going back to school days, for me, uh, I remember being in a play and the teacher asked us to get up on stage and and, uh, uh, and practice, and I was practicing uh, singing badly, only to find out that the PA system around the whole school was switched on. No, <laughs> oh, you sing it. Uh, it was Joseph and his technical dream kit. <laughs> I hope there's a recording of that no, somewhere no. on fire. We're going to do our best to uncover it. Thank you all very much. Zach Palatsky from the Green Party, Tori B. Craig Whitaker, Luciana Berger, Chief Executive of In-House Communications, and James Heal from The Spectator. Thank you for your questions too. Uh, coming up after news, we're going to be talking a little bit more about an issue that we touched on with the panel, homelessness. As a cold snap hits the UK, what more needs to be done to help people who are on the street or in temporary accommodation? How big an issue is this? And as we were hearing, when we could tackle it during the pandemic with a little bit of political will, are we not giving enough attention to something that perhaps should be treated as much more of a national emergency? That's next. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, school children and firefighters have been among dozens of people laying flowers at a lake in near Birmingham where three boys died. The boys, who were eight, ten and eleven, suffered cardiac arrests after falling through the ice in Solihull yesterday afternoon. A fourth boy is critically ill in hospital. Local Tory MP Saqib Bharti visited it a 